Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first webinar in a series uh, that are part of the project So Chic. Um, today we have Jean Baptiste Salé uh, from the Sorbonne University in Paris, who's the project coordinator for So Chic, who's going to tell us about the uh, the project and give us an overview. Um, before uh, we start, I'll just uh, give a quick rundown of the technical um, aspects of this webinar. So, at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a button uh, marked Q&A. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, we can, you can type those in there and um, we'll be able to see them and then we can address them. We'll probably um, address them all uh, at the end of the webinar. You can also, um, if you click um, if you click on the participants at the bottom and then there is a button where you can click to raise your hand and that indicates you would like to speak. Um, so we can, uh, we can manage those and try to, um, if you'd rather ask your, your uh, question via the audio, then I can unmute you and you can, you can uh, ask your question there. But again, we'll save those to the end. So make sure you take notes and you can ask your questions at the end. Um, uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the SoChic YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so keep an eye out for, for that if you want to watch it again and relive all the moments. Uh, and you can also share it with people. I mean, people, a lot of people might not be able to watch at this time because of the time differences and so on. So make sure you keep an eye on the YouTube channel for the recording. Um, I am Joseph Nolan from the European Polar Board. We're a partner in the SoSheet project. Uh, and I'll be moderating the questions for the webinar today. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, JB. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so as uh, Joseph just said, this, this is the introductory webinar for the So Chic project. And um, before I, I, I start this webinar, I'd like to um, thank you all for being present uh, online. Uh, during uh, this uh, specific moment that we're all experiencing, which might be uh, challenging and, and difficult from, uh, for many of us with the lockdown. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here and I wish you all my best and I hope you are safe uh, where you are. Personally, I'm, I'm confined uh, uh, lockdown here uh, in southern France, uh, in the countryside, which is actually a pleasant place. Uh, the only internet connection I have is my phone uh, connection, so I hope there won't be any uh, technical problem. Uh, if there's any issue with the bandwidth, I might switch off my camera. We'll see how it goes. Um, a challenge that I had when preparing the slides for this talk is the, the audience is, is actually very diverse. So the choice I made uh, is to have really a general introduction at, at a general audience level. Uh, so I won't go, go too much in the details. Uh, and I will spend a significant time trying to explain why we uh, care about the Sun Nation and what the, why the Sun Nation does have a large impact on climate. Uh, that will take me probably around 15 to 20 minutes and then I switch to the to the socialic objectives and the methodology that we are uh, proposing uh, that we will uh, uh, employ to address those objectives and again I will stay on a general uh, level so I apologize in advance for the many experts that I have seen names uh, in the participant list uh, if it's a little bit frustrating to not go more in the details, but uh, feel free to ask questions and I, I, I'd be very happy to uh, answer them at the end of this talk or, or feel free to reach out by email if you, if you want to. And uh, again, uh, I'd be very pleased to uh, answer a question later on. So, uh, SOSHIC stands for Southern Ocean Carbon and Heat Impact on Climate. And so as the name says it all, um, the mm -hmm. 
the regional focus can i change the slide yeah the regional focus is on the southern ocean this vast ocean uh, that sits uh, on the southern hemisphere around the antarctic continent and so as i said the, the first question i, I really want to ad to address is why do we care about the southern ocean and actually i could i could go on for for hours on on why we we should care about the southern ocean and and i i, I could actually uh take the emotive uh on the and say that uh when you actually go there and and see the place and the the immensity of the place the beauty also of the place you you definitely care about it and 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 want to preserve it and and understand how it works but instead of this emotive approach i'd like to to really ground my answer here into scientific context and in particular within the programmatic context that got this project funded this project got funded by the reopen commission to address uh, what they call what we call the social challenge 5 on climate action under the H2020 program uh, to uh, fight and adapt to climate change and uh, under the call uh, to address knowledge uh, gaps in climate science in support of IPCC report. So really, I, I'd like to address the question of, of why we care about this notion in terms of, of climate impact and why does the European Commission care uh, about that notion? So, there is still many answers that I could give uh, for for why we should care about the third notion in this context, and I've I've selected for you four main reasons. The first one is South Ocean is a central place for the global ocean circulation. Here I've got a schematic that uh, shows this global ocean circulation circulation that we often call uh, the Great Conveyor Belt, or in more scientific terms, the the global overturning circulation. And clearly on this schematic, you see that this, the Southern Ocean is the central place for the global uh, ocean circulation. It's basically the masterpiece that connects all the different basins of the world. That's because of the Southern Ocean that the global circulation can exist. And it's also uh, uh, an important part of the circulation for connecting the different layers on the vertical of the global ocean circulation. Here, the red arrows are showing mostly the, 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 the close to surface circulation and the blue arrows, the bottom circulation. As an example of the importance of the Southern Ocean, we estimate that uh, almost 65% of the entire ocean water mass that exists on the globe make their first contact with the, atmo with the atmosphere in the Southern Ocean. So the vast majority of the, of the global ocean actually set their characteristic in the contact with the atmosphere in the Southern Ocean. The second reason why we should care about the Southern Ocean is the unique habitat it creates for a, a unique biodiversity. Uh, turns out that this habitat uh, with ice cliffs, sea ice, and, and, and vast and hostile for human ocean, uh, is actually quickly changing. Uh, the sea ice regionally uh, experience large change. Uh, ocean is warming. It's also acidifi it's acidifying uh, with the, the carbon that we emit in the atmosphere and that's absorbed in the, in the ocean. And so the, this habitat is, is perturbed and, uh, and therefore perturbed the, the biodiversity. As one example uh, of, the importance of, of the, the importance of the change that experienced the habitat in the, in the Southern Ocean, we estimate that the problem of acidification uh, for biodiversity, so what I call the problem of, of acidification is when the water becomes undersaturated with respect to aragonite. So that means that when acidification cross a threshold that the, the makes uh, some species uh, struggle to grow their shell. Uh, we will cross this, uh, this uh, threshold uh, in the Southern Ocean by 2030, and that's one of the first places on Earth, uh, that's what we estimate anyway, uh, and that's one of the first places on Earth where we will cross this threshold. So really we need to, to understand this place and the impact for the biodiversity over there. A third reason, which is a bit more global, is that Southern Ocean is actually crucial if we want to understand current and future global sea level rise. There are two main processes 
that can cause global sea level rise. First one is when you add fresh water that sits on land and you put it in the ocean, you increase uh, the, the you, you basically add water to the ocean. And the second one is by warming the water masses. So it's what we call thermal expansion. So when you warm water masses, you dilate the, the ocean, it takes more volume and the, the sea level rise. It turns out that the Southern Ocean is important for these two aspects. The first one, so the Southern Ocean uh, circulate around the uh, Antarctic ice sheet, which is the largest uh, reservoir of fresh water that sits on land on Earth. Uh, and it turns out that this Antarctic ice sheet is losing uh, mass, has been losing mass over the last few decades, and this loss of mass is accelerating, which creates global, which creates the sea level rise. And we know today that this Antarctic ice sheet uh, mass loss is primarily due to uh, ocean basal melt. So it's really the ocean and the, the, the warming of the ocean, the, the circulation of the ocean that creates this, uh, this uh, loss of mass of the Antarctic ice sheet. And it turns out actually that that's one of our main uncertainty when we want to predict future sea level rise. We need to better understand how the ocean is warming and how the ocean circulation might change. For the second uh, process, thermal expansion, uh, actually uh, the global ocean is warming uh, almost everywhere, but that's uh, in the Southern Ocean that almost all the heat uh, that's stored in the ocean enters. Uh, it's estimated that up to 75% of all the heat absorbed by the world ocean actually enters by the Southern Ocean, causing uh, thermal expansion and therefore global sea level rise. So really, we need to understand uh, Southern Ocean uh, warming or uptake of heat. And finally, a fourth reason why we should really care about Southern Ocean, again, a global scale reason, uh, it's because it's, it's uh, central to understand current and future global air temperature, which is definitely a key policy relevant uh, question. Uh, and because here the, 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 the link uh, between Southern Ocean and global air temperature might appear a bit less straightforward than the other reason, I, I will spend a little bit more time on that one. So let me come back on, on Earth's energy equilibrium. So the, the Earth uh, in, in, at equilibrium receives some heat uh, energy from the sun and emits some heat uh, to the space. There is a bit more heat coming in that go, going out and that makes our home, uh, the Earth, uh, to a, an equilibrium temperature around 14 to 15 degrees Celsius. Now, if we have a disequilibrium to this energy uh, balance, and we, when we add greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we emit to, this, to space a bit less energy. And so we accumulate energy in the Earth's uh, climate system. That's what we call excess energy. It's actually a key question in climate science is to measure, to measure this excess energy and where it goes. We can, we can measure uh, this excess energy, and that's what I'm showing in this curve here. That's basically showing this excess energy associated to climate change from the 70s to uh, now, or a few years ago. And you see this excess energy uh, increasing year by year. That's what we call uh, global uh, warming. Uh, and now you can actually decompose this excess energy into a different compartment where it's stored. And when you do that, you realize that more than 90% of this excess energy is going in the ocean. In comparison, only 1% is going in the atmosphere. And when you do this decomposition, you really realize that if we want to understand uh, atmospheric temperature change, which, 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 which we really care because we live in the atmosphere, we need to understand the ocean sink because if we've got a small change in ocean sinks, let's say going from 90 to 89%, that can have dramatic impact for the atmospheric uh, content of it, basically doubling. So that's uh, what I call, the, uh, that's, that's basically this relationship that I'm uh, simplifying here uh, on this, uh, on this uh, idealizing here on this uh, figure. Uh, if we want to know the relationship between atmospheric uh, uh, greenhouse effect and global atmospheric warming, we need to know how much it goes in the oceans. Now the questions become a little bit more complex because usually politics, they, they ask about 
remaining emission we can emit. Basically, they ask, how, how much carbon can I still uh, burn uh, to reach such level of warming? That's typically the question uh, for the Paris Agreement. We want to reach 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. How much carbon can I still emit to reach that uh, target? So we need to know basically how carbon emissions relate to atmospheric uh, carbon concentration. To do that, we look at carbon budget, global carbon budget. And so here I'm showing uh, this uh, relationship between emission and storage of carbon. So emissions are shown by the, the red arrows that human induce emissions. And so that creates carbon that can be stored in the atmosphere or in the ocean or in land. And when you actually do the budget, you realize that almost 25% of emissions are going in the ocean. And so if we want to understand, if we want to relate emission, human induced emission to growth of atmospheric carbon, we need to understand again uh, the ocean carbon sink. That's what I, I summarize uh, here on this simplified figure. To relate human emissions to atmospheric carbon, we need to know how much carbon goes in the ocean. That's typically what we call carbon response of the, climate, of the carbon response. And the second, uh, uh, relationship that I presented before is the relationship between atmospheric carbon to glo global atmospheric warming. That's what we call climate response. And if we put these two together, we get the relationship between emissions and future air temperature. And that's this key figure that's presented. That's a figure that I got from extracted from the uh, IPCC special report at 1.5 degree. The key policy relevant figure that are a lot of echo in the political sphere, also in the societies. Uh, uh, Greta Thunberg uh, used that, that figure a lot to, uh, to talk about remaining emission. Uh, anyway, that's a key, key figure that, we, that, we that, uh, that is useful uh, uh, in the policy context. And when you look at this figure, that's basically so, uh, saying if you want to reach 1.5, we, we can emit uh, that much carbon emission. So we still have that much that we can emit. Now, when you look at the details, you see that there is still uh, some uncertainty that we uh, definitely want to reduce. There is those uncertainty come from different sources, but one of these sources is the ocean and carbon, uh, heat and carbon sink. So when a politic uh, ask how much remaining emission for future warming at 1.5, 2 or 3.5, pick your, pick your best choice. Uh, we say let's study the ocean heat and carbon storage. And so let's have a look at this ocean heat and carbon storage, or at least an estimate of it. Here I'm showing the, the, the uptake of carbon on, left, on the left and heat on the right, estimated from a numerical simulation from a recent paper. So basically the, the uptake at the atmosphere ocean interface. And what you, you very clearly see on this figure is the southern ocean is one of the key plays for both of these quantities. Southern Ocean represents 50%, up to 50% of ocean carbon uptake uh, by the ocean, uh, and uh, up to 75% of ocean heat uptake. So basically, the Southern Ocean is playing uh, this role of a big sponge on Earth that's uh, capturing, absorbing uh, heat and carbon uh, from the sea surface, from the atmosphere, and inject it to the deep interior. And so we need to understand this thing. And it turns out that because it's, an, it's a very uh, vast ocean, also because it's, it's uh, far away from any of the uh, main inhabited continents, uh, it's probably the ocean that we, uh, that we understand uh, the, the least well. So let's have a look at, at this. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit more on southern, southern ocean circulation and, and try to understand why it's so central for heat and carbon uptake. One thing you have to understand is, is the ocean is layered a bit like an onion and with a lot of layers. And it's very hard to, to cross those layers for a climate signal. So you can uh, put a climate signal at the surface, but it, it will be very hard to, for it to propagate to the, to the deep ocean. One exception on Earth is the Southern Ocean, where you've got these, these layers of the onion that are tilted. They are tilted because of a very strong current over there that circulate around uh, the Antarctic continent clockwise. And that creates a vertical circulation that is relatively efficient to, uh, to exchange uh, uh, tracers from the deep ocean to the surface or from the surface to the deep ocean. 
Now, there are still many processes that we don't really understand completely uh, in, this, in these processes, uh, in this story. And so one could ask, if you don't fully understand all the processes, how can you be sure that this notion is, is important for, for capturing carbon and heat uh, in the interior? Well, you can actually look at tracer and change over the last few decades. If you look at temperature change in the ocean water masses, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm summarizing uh, many different studies um, that have shown that the, 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 the southern ocean is actually warming quite uh, strongly, rapidly at depth. Uh, it's actually one of the, some of the water masses in the southern ocean are the, the, the most, uh, uh, the, the are warming uh, very quickly compared to the rest of the world. You can look at different tracer. Uh, I could have shown carbon, but I don't have it handy. So I'm, I'm showing instead freshwater here, just as an example of an ocean tracer. And again, uh, you see this climate signal propagating in, in the sun ocean at the surface. We, we observe a freshening, and this freshening is actually uh, injected at depth uh, by the circulation. So for all these reasons, uh, in the SOCIC project, we want to understand uh, and quantify the viability of heat and carbon budget in the sun ocean. And to address uh, this objective, which is quite ambitious, uh, we've divided the question in different pillars. Uh, and, and before going into this pillar, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back on a few numbers uh, for the project. So there are, we, we are, uh, as part of the SOCIC project, 15 partners, one partner in South Africa and 14 partners in, in the, on the European continent. The project will last for four years and we are funded uh, through the European Commission. You've got uh, many logos here for, for the different partners and also a few faces uh, which might be familiar um, of the PI of the project. So now going to, this, to these pillars where, where we basically try to divide this main objective that we have. So we've got eight of these of this, uh, pillars, work packages. Now, uh, the four first work packages are really focusing on key processes. So wh what we've done in this project, is we've tried to identify why, what we think are the key processes that are blocking or advance to further understand uh, the, the heat and carbon budget. So we will try to, uh, to, to really further understanding of each of these key processes on dedicated work packages. Then once we've got a better understanding of these processes, we want to understand how they fit back on the larger, on the larger scale and on the climate system, uh, atmospheric and global. And finally, we've got two work package that focus on data and project management. I won't go too much in the details in this, in, in this webinar because that might be less interesting for, for the audience, but, but it's definitely two important points that we value uh, a lot in this project, in particularly uh, data management and, and, and data uh, transparency and sharing. So we, we've got a full uh, work package dedicated to that. So now I'll go through uh, each of these work packages very quickly, uh, very briefly, to uh, give a little bit more uh, context uh, uh, to the objective and, and what we want to do. So the first of the, of the four key processes that we've identified uh, that are blocking uh, or advance, uh, we think, is air sea fluxes. So how uh, the clim how any climate signal cross uh, the, the atmosphere ocean interface. So the goal for in this work package is to obtain a full annual cycle time series of high resolution air IC uh, flux of heat, momentum, carbon dioxide, and estimate an Antarctic zone net flux. And I've got two figures here that, that are basically a motivation for this goal. On the left, uh, I've got a map of heat flux uh, from a, a reanalysis. What I call reanalysis is basically a numerical model that we, uh, that we try to make as close as possible from observation. And the black dots on this same figure are showing the actual uh, observation of uh, air sea heat flux. So basically what you see from this map is we've got no clue from observations what, uh, and sorry, I forgot to say, this is the winter, uh, winter estimate. So from this observation, we've got no clue what's going on in terms of air sea heat flux in winter. 
And so re really the reanalysis uh, is, is really unconstrained by observation. So we need to uh, do a better job and that's what we'll try uh, in this work package. On the right, I've got a figure uh, for motivating for carbon flux. That's a figure extracted from a, a recent paper by Alison Gray, uh, which is showing on the, on the y-axis uh, the, the atmosphere ocean uh, flux of carbon. Uh, positive values means uh, a flux from the ocean to the atmosphere. And the dashed and, and dotted line are historical observations. I won't go into, uh, into uh, I mean, there's still a lot of debates on these different estimates, uh, but the point I want to make with this figure is really that a paper published two years ago basically revisits uh, historical observation by two to threefold. So that's basically the, the level of, of understanding or ignorance in terms of carbon flux, which we again need to do a better job about. And that's again what we want to do in this work package. I will work on this work package with Seb Swart from the University of, um, of Gothenburg in, in Sweden, Mario Opema from Germany, Avi, Brian Ward from the University of Galway, uh, Jacqueline Boutin from here in Paris, Simon Josie from NOC in, in the UK, and Pedro Montero from CSIR in Cape Town, South Africa. Once we better understand uh, the air sea fluxes, we want to better understand the upper ocean ventilation. So basically how the climate signal, once it's entered the ocean interface, is propagated in the deep ocean. There is many ways this, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the climate signal or any signal can be propagated across the base of the surface layer. And, and basically uh, there is a, a zoo of, of different turbulent processes that can do that for, for us. These turbulent processes, they can be, uh, they, they, they derive their energy from, from winds and, and intense buoyancy fluxes in the, in the Southern Ocean. And, and what we want to do, uh, the, our main goal in this work package is to determine the lead rate control processes of ventilation. So which one of these uh, processes among the zoo of processes existing, should we focus on and should we really wait uh, and better represent in, um, in numerical models, including climate models. So I will work on this work package with Alex Browley uh, from British Antarctic Survey in, in the UK, uh, David Marshall from the University of Oxford, David Ferra from the University of Reading, Alberto Navarra-Gabarato from NOC in Southampton, and Seb Swart from the University of, of Gothenburg, Sweden. The third work package will look at the other, uh, the other side, so at bottom ocean ventilation. Uh, so basically you've got this, this current that can sink uh, along the continental shelf and that can ventilate uh, the ocean by the bottom. And what we want to, uh, uh, to, to do in this, in this work package is to describe and understand the dynamics of dense water formation, transformation and export out of the southern ocean. And the, one, one important motivation for this work package is this figure from uh, of, uh, a paper by uh, Céline Eze published in 2013, which shows uh, on the left upper uh, panel the, an observation-based estimate of bottom temperature, and all the other panels are different estimate, uh, deviation of, from observation in different climate models from different climate model group around the world. So the deviation is, is shown in, in, in degrees Celsius, uh, the blue and red uh, scale. And the scale is actually going from minus two degrees to plus uh, two degrees. So it's a, it's a very large range for bottom water, for bottom of the ocean. And what this figure shows is basically the climate models are all over the place and have large deviation compared to observation. So that's an important uncertainty for climate model that we uh, really uh, need to uh, do better. So uh, I'll, I'll work on this work package with uh, Svein Osterus from U University of Bergen, uh, Andrew Myers, Mike Mergit, and Paula Bramson uh, from British Antarctic Survey in, in uh, Cambridge, UK, Casimir Delavergne and Gervon Madek uh, from uh, L'Océan in Paris, and Thorsten Conser from Ivy in Germany. 
And finally, the fourth uh, key processes that we've identified is uh, what we call abrupt convection event. It's basically events where, we, where you've got the, the water column that destabilized uh, from the surface to a uh, great depth, basically shortcutting all the different processes that I introduced before. When you've got this kind of abrupt event, you actually mix some uh, relatively warm water to the surface. And so a fingerprint of these events is a big hole in the sea ice cover. That's what we observed uh, back in 2070s and is shown here on, on this figure uh, that I extracted from a, a paper by Ethan Campbell. Um, and, and what we want to understand here uh, in this work package is to assess the balance of physical processes that control the emergence and the persistence of these events and their impact on the large scale circulation. These events are, are really rare. Uh, we have observed uh, uh, this event in 2016 and 2017. Uh, before that, it was uh, most in the, in, the, in the 70s. So we have very little observations uh, uh, in this kind of events. And so we, we, we really want to, to push further our understanding of these events. I'll work on this work package with Alberto Navarra Gabarato from NOC in, in, the, in Southampton, Fabian Roquet and Seb Swart from University of Gothenburg in, in Sweden, Alex Brawley uh, from uh, BAS, British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge, UK, David Ferreira uh, from University of Reading and Govan Madek from uh, here in Paris. Uh, now switching, so after, after uh, I've worked on these four uh, key processes, we, we aim at, at looking at how the impact on the copper climate system. And so that's the aim of this uh, fifth uh, work package. And so the, the, the goal is, is really to determine the impact of, of Polynia and other weather sea events on weather and climate. There's actually a lot of work that's been uh, done uh, for uh, the impact of convection event in the North Atlantic for regional climate in North America and Europe. But there's much less work for the Southern Ocean counterpart. And that's what we, we'd like to, um, to push a little bit in this work package. And as, a, as an example, or as motivation uh, for this work package, I'm showing here a, pay, a figure from a, a recent paper by Zhang. Uh, which shows the impact of a Polydia event for sea surface temperature and sea ice concentration 30-year uh, trend after an event. And what this, this paper is arguing is that the, the trend that we have, have been observing over the last few decades is actually, might actually be due to the, to the appearance of a Polydia event in the 70s. Still a lot of debates about it, we, we, uh, but, but that's, that's uh, provocative and interesting. Um, uh, points and so we want to we, we want to uh, to work on that in this work package and I, I'll work on that with Wonson Park uh, from uh, Geoma in Germany and David Ferreira from University of Reading in the UK and finally the fifth uh, the, the sixth uh, work package uh, the last scientific work package is uh, looking at variability and trend of carbon and heat storage and basically, so this uh, work package is, is linking uh, the fluxes with the ventilation and the storage. So basically linking uh, all the different work package together to uh, address the question of storage and, and decadal viability. So the goal is to quantify the heat, uh, uh, the uptake of heat and carbon in the sun ocean and subsequent transport and storage. And so I'll work on that with Nikki Gruber from uh, ETH uh, in Zurich, uh, Switzerland, Thorsten Konser from AVI in Germany, and, and Tila Roy from Ecosiana in Paris. So now uh, coming back to this big picture, uh, so we've got these this eight different uh, work packages, or six scientific work packages, and I haven't told you too much about the approach yet. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you only a few words very briefly on, on the general approach that we want to, uh, to tackle in this project. The approach is, is, is similar in all the work packages. They are, they are a combination of observation and numerical model. And with uh, both observation and numerical model, we've got a hierarchical approach with for observation targeted innovative experiment where we really uh, look at detail uh, 
at the detail of a particular process and through uh, long-term monitoring of the climate system. For the numer numerical model, again, we've got a similar hierarchical approach going from very high resolution, process-oriented configuration, idealized configuration through a system model, cost resolution model. And so really the, 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 the ambition of this pro project is to study the key processes at the local scale to uh, better understand uh, the, the, imp the importance for climate. The observation plan, I, I, I'll go very briefly on this one. Uh, we've got two dedicated crews uh, at two different sites uh, that, will, uh, that we will um, do in 2021 and 2022. Uh, one site where we'll focus mostly on surface processes, small scale with fleets of uh, gliders and, and we we'll also have sail drones, sail boys, a lot of different um, uh, automated instruments, also uh, RC, RC flex mast, uh, to really look at the detailed uh, processes of RC flexes and interaction with the surface layer. A second site will focus more on the bottom part of the water column. And we will uh, also leverage on uh, the long-term monitoring program that been, that have been going on for years or decades in uh, the Weddell Sea sector, that's the sector where we'll, we focus mostly, uh, where the different partners of this project uh, have had uh, long-term monitoring pro uh, projects. And one aspect of this, of this uh, project, one, one innovative aspect of this project is to put together this uh, national program uh, together to really have a, a larger scale uh, view and understanding of the sound nation. In terms of numerical simulation plan, again, I don't want to go into details. We've got a, a number of different configurations that will run in this project in combination with observations. Um, going again from idealized patch uh, through very high uh, resolution, uh, regional configuration, realistic, or through a copper climate model with nested very high resolution in the sun nation. Um, so yeah, basically all this configuration, the framework uh, that we'll uh, use is NEMO mostly, uh, but then there will be also a couple of configuration using MIT GCN. So I will leave it here. Um, uh, really as a conclusion, I, 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 first I hope that you found this uh, introduction interesting. Uh, and I hope uh, probably even more that we will have fun and do a great science in the coming four years. Uh, given the great partners that I have, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, we will have fun and do great science. I'm not talking about myself, but, but my partners. Um, I also look forward to some close collaboration with what I call your sister project within and outside European uh, Union. Uh, I've got, I put many logos there. I won't go through all of them. Uh, maybe only a, two of them uh, outside European Commission uh, funded project, uh, the SOCOM project, uh, which is uh, uh, a US funded project, NSF funded project, uh, which has very similar objectives, but very different approach. Well, I, I really hope that we'll have a close collaboration. And the orchestra project, uh, which is a UK funded project, again, with similar objective and different approach. Uh, and where we definitely will have close collaboration with our partners in, com in common between the two projects. Also, I want to, uh, to tell you that we are very open to uh, collaborations and discussions. So, uh, so if, um, if you feel like it, feel free to send us an email or reach out by any means uh, to discuss uh, possibilities to at least discuss and, and maybe collaborate. So I will leave it here uh, with this uh, slide that shows a number of way, different ways to get more information or, or news or, or with my email to reach out if you, if you want more information. Again, uh, feel free to, uh, to contact me. Uh, before finishing, I just to want to thank you all again. Uh, I'll be very pleased to take questions now. And also, I think Joseph mentioned it, but just in, I, I can't. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. So just uh, just to make sure. So this this webinar is uh, is is part of a series of webinar uh, that we will have across the the 
along the, the Soshik project. So, so if you're interested by uh, listening to other Soshik webinar, um, uh, follow news threads or, or, or have a look at the European Polar Board, uh, which we're organize, organizing this webinar. Thank you, and I'll now take questions. Thank you very much, uh, JB. Uh, that was great. We've got um, a few questions have come in already. Um, if anyone has more, um, it's best if you type them into the uh, Q&A box. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen. And we can make sure none of them get missed then. But if we just go straight into the first questions, I mean, there's also been some lively discussion in the, in the chat box, which is good to see as well. Um, First question is regarding 75% uh, of, of heat being absorbed by the, the Southern Ocean. And the um, question is about over which period is that and how much confidence can we have knowing how sparsely ob um, observed the Southern Ocean is compared to, to other, other oceans? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, the, the confidence, uh, so, so, th so this is from a, a a numerical that's a numerical estimate uh, in terms of observation based estimate we would have a very low confidence uh, we've got more confidence in terms of storage of heat 75% uh, was about the, uh, the uptake so the, the, the flux across the interface uh, in terms of the storage we've got more confidence based on observations and um, the last IPCC report I believe uh, says that on, on the special report on ocean and cryosphere, I estimate that uh, around 40 to 60 40 percent, to I think, depending on the time period, um, as we, of, of the global ocean heat content has been stored in the South Nation South of 30 South. An important, uh, um, uh, an important constraint is the, the definition of the South Nation. And so you can have uh, numbers that varies a lot depending on the definition of South Nation. But in terms of storage, uh, our confidence is uh, is relatively high uh, in terms of IPCC confidence level language. I think it's uh, I think it, it might be medium confidence uh, that that forty to sixty percent is is uh, stored in the cell nation since the seventies, I believe. Good, and I think uh, somebody posted a link in the chat box to a, a paper that goes a little bit into more detail on that, so everyone can um, follow that link to read up some more. Uh, the next question is that uh, given that thermal expansion is a th function of temperature and that the Southern Ocean is relatively com cold compared to the tropics or the subtropics, what is the relative importance of thermal expansion from the Southern Ocean to global mean sea level rise, or even regionally? Mm, well, I don't have the, the numbers in, in mind, but the, the, the point I was making there is uh, that the, the fluxes, the, 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 the atmospheric, the, the atmosphere to ocean uh, heat flux is large. Uh, let's say we've got large uncertainty, maybe not 75%, but large. Uh, and then this, this ocean is, is spread over the global ocean. Uh, uh, so, so, so that was uh, my point. So this, this heat is entering the ocean and then it's stored in, in the different uh, part of the world oceans. Uh, in terms of the contribution, uh, the, 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 the proportion of, of thermal expansion from the southern ocean, let's say south of 30 south, I don't have the numbers in mind. I'm sure uh, you can find out some more later um, and there can be more discussion if anyone has yeah, questions. Very happy if those numbers are all in, in yeah. special report of Ocean and Cryosphere, I'd be very happy to dig them out uh, if you send me an email. The uh, next question is regarding the CMIT model, models. Um, and we know uh, there are many biases in the Southern Ocean that persist. Uh, which biases do you think are most relevant for ocean heat uptake and carbon uptake and whether Soshik is concerned with improving climate models uh, for more, more robust projections. 
Yeah, so that's um, so I will I will uh, focus on the on the ocean uh, biases or errors or uncertainties in, in those climate models, uh, and and uh, Soshik is definitely uh, so so that's definitely a goal of Soshik is to uh, uh, when I say better understand the skew processes the one big motivation it's not the only one but one big motivation is to improve understanding of the processes to better represent them in in numerical model and and in climate models. And um, what are important uncertainty, uh, I believe, are those, those key processes uh, that uh, I was mentioning before. So the, 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 air, uh, the, the flux across the, the uh, air sea interface, the, the flux across the base of the surface layer, and this bottom water uh, ventilation as well. And that's all related to uh, to the, the, the large scale uh, submersion circulation, which is uh, uncertain this, because of all these this, this processes. There is one, there is one key uh, uncertainty that comes from uh, uh, ocean uh, ice shelf interaction, uh, which I believe is probably uh, an important uncertainty in the submersion circulation because we don't represent them in, in the current generation of climate model. This, uh, Ocean ice shelf interaction, but we won't address it. Address that limitation or that uncertainty in this project. We've got uh, a, a project uh, that got funded on the, the same call, uh, which is called TPAX, uh, which will address this question of ocean ice shelf interaction, and in which we, we, we will work very closely together. I think that has has more or less answered the. The next question as well, so we'll move along uh, to the next one. Is asking how will this uh, the Sochik project complement current funded, uh, currently funded sister projects, and is there any sort of cross project coordination? I would note here that Sochik has uh, recently become a part of the EU Polar Cluster, um, which is a, a, a network of EU funded projects on Arctic and Antarctic research. So there's some work through there, but uh, JB can talk specifically about these sister projects. Yeah, so there's, there's a different, um, so we, we definitely value very much the, the, the collaboration and the interactions between the different projects. Uh, and uh, that's organized uh, through different levels. So uh, for, uh, collaborations with uh, project where I'm very close just because the, we, we can have uh, common partners uh, like uh, TPAX or Orchestra uh, will just uh, collaborate and organize the, the collaboration and, and, the, and the knowledge advancement of, through those partners. Um, there's also uh, those clusters at the European Commission, uh, the European uh, Commission level. Uh, so uh, Joseph talked about this polar cluster. There is also um, a modeling cluster, I believe. Uh, there is also this All Atlantic Alliance uh, for all the pr project focusing on the Atlantic. So th this different kind of of, uh, of uh, structure existing within the European Commission's uh, framework, uh, where. Uh, which are basically avenues for collaboration and that, that the, so I'm relatively new to this, uh, so the, the project started a few months ago. We are relatively new in those, in those clusters, but they, 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 they turns out to, to, to be quite efficient with quite interesting discussions and meetings uh, through those clusters. And then there is also um, collaboration with project outside the European Commission umbrella. Uh, so, they, so for instance, uh, I mentioned the SOCOM project in the US, which is uh, an important, uh, definitely an important project in the US and for the, the, the Southern Ocean community in general. And um, we haven't discussed so far uh, too much about uh, detailed collaboration, but we've got, uh, we invited uh, pre from the SOCOM project into uh, what we call our advisory board. Uh, so we have uh, established some connection there for an efficient communication between these different projects. 
Good. Uh, now I'll just jump over to the chat box where we've had a couple of questions come through. Uh, one uh, asking or, or commenting on uh, how it would be interesting to investigate the effects in the Southern Ocean that have been describing on the microbial communities in the, in the Southern Ocean uh, as they are important parts of the carbon cycles, both as a, both as a, as a sink and a source of carbon. Is this something that's been considered in Sochi? Uh, it's uh, it's not considered, uh, and I and I'm afraid uh, this is uh, uh, too far uh, beyond my expertise. So I, I'm not able to comment. Uh, probably or, or, or partners uh, which are more expert in the carbon cycle than myself could. Better understand that a bit better uh, answer that question, but unfortunately, I can't. I would say it's not been completely forgotten, but uh, so she will, will definitely link up with um, other other initiatives looking at those specifics. Um, and we also have a question uh, about how important is the physical versus the oh, this is the similar question. The physical versus the biological carbon uptake in the in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and are there expected to be changes to these in the future and possible changes expected in the biological pump? So. Yeah, the, again, interesting, uh, interesting question that uh, I, I won't go too much in the details because of my own expertise. But um, so, so it's expected that both of these pumps change uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the biological uh, pump. Uh, I think a lot of the future change uh, depends on on physical aspects, especially turbulence in the surface layer, uh, which we uh, it's not the, the only uh, it's not the only aspect, but that's one uh, probably one uh, important control that we don't. So, so that link again to uh, to uh, to uh, to physical uh, questions that we will address in this in this project. Uh, so yeah, the um, I cannot yet answer uh, this question. Hopefully, in a few years. Okay. Um, so next, uh, we've got quite a lot of questions. This is good. We've got plenty coming through. Um, are you planning to make use of existing data from the Argo array in the Southern Ocean? Yeah, so I haven't, so indeed this observation plan slide that I, I passed very quickly, uh, I didn't mention, but of course we will leverage on all the existing observation uh, programs and networks, including, of course, uh, the amazing Argo and Bio Argo array uh, and the growing uh, deep Argo array. Uh, so we will uh, use this observation also a complement so that we put uh, deployment of floats as well plan. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely part of the plan. And uh, could you give some details on how the air sea fluxes will be measured? Uh, so we'll have um, so, so air sea fluxes, that's a quite generic term, but for, for so, so we measure mostly heat carbon, a little bit of momentum flux. Um, we'll have on the ship, we'll, we'll have a air sea flux mass to, uh, to look at the, basically the covariance terms. Um, we will also have uh, buoys for carbon, so uh, buoys with PCO2 measurements. We'll have a sail drone again with PCO2 measurements for in terms of carbon fluxes. Um, what else? Uh, we might have a wave glider again. So, so, so really, uh, so, so to, to really the, the measuring the PCO2 at the at the at the surface for for carbon, and uh, yeah, that's it. Great. Uh, we also have a question: in In which season are the two process cruises planned to be? And linked to that, uh, another question with the cruise plan for 2021 and uh, might the coronavirus Im uh, impact that cruise and is there a backup plan? So hopefully not, but... Uh... Uh, 
so first questions, which season? Uh, I'd love to go in winter. Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> no, but that's difficult to go over the winter. So we, there will be summer cruises. Um, but we, uh, one important aspect of the project, which I haven't mentioned, uh, is, um, is we leave uh, autonomous, autonomous platforms for the entire winter. So we, we will, uh, that's one of the goals, uh, get uh, observations in the winter period, through, but with two uh, summer cruises. Um, whether the COVID situation will impact the cruise, uh, I have no clue yet. Uh, I hope not. Uh, it's such a mess to organize one cruise. Uh, but so yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have a backup plan because basically uh, three weeks ago, I believe uh, we were unsure what was the COVID or four weeks ago. So so we will uh, we will see how it goes and and try to do our best. Next question is: uh, Will there be any linkages with the Arctic and ongoing projects in the Arctic Ocean? Uh, there is no uh, through through uh, through the different uh, channel that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, so, for instance, the polar cluster that Joseph mentioned, uh, which is basically. A group of different uh, H2020. So H2020 is, is the European Commission uh, collaborative project program. Um, uh, so through this, through the this polar cluster across different European Commission funded project, uh, we love we we do have interaction with um, different polar uh, project, and a lot of them are in the Arctic. Uh, there is no uh, clear, obvious link yet that's been, that have been established, but we do have this uh, avenue and, and uh, basically, um, yeah, we do have this, this avenue and, and, and framework uh, uh, to discuss with the other project and to see if there is any uh, ways and interest to interact with Arctic-based project. Next question. Uh, the observation points and long-term monitoring programs are mainly focused on which parameters and are isotopic traces uh, included in the project? So, Can you repeat the question? Sorry. It says that the observation points and long-time monitoring programs um, are mainly focused on, on which parameters, which parameters are being uh, measured in the monitoring programs and our isotopic traces being included? Uh, so the parameters are basically the conventional uh, physical oceanography and biogeochemical oceanography tracers, uh, temperature, salinity, pressure, um, velocity, uh, where we can, um, and for carbon, DIC, alkalinity, uh, nitrates. Um, and PCO2, of course, uh, and uh, isotopes. They are. I'm, I'm actually uh, becoming more, 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 more and more of a fan of of, uh, of oxygen isotope, what stable water isotope. Uh, so it was not planned in the project, but we'll definitely uh, continue a building time series of uh, of water stable isotopes as part of this project. So the, uh, the exact uh, parameters are not entirely fixed. It's uh, project is a little bit uh, adaptive and flexible as to what, what we can do. Well, the core, the core are definitely fixed. Yeah, but yes. We, uh, we, we are investigating depending on different opportunities of yeah. collaborations and we're also adding more. Uh, the next question uh, regards to the, the, the zoo of different processes is contributing to subduction and transfer from the mixed layer to the thermocline. Uh, and can you expand on the processes that you think are the rate limiter? Uh, uh, 
Um, but uh, I would say, yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's, so I, I could explain, but I wouldn't be very uh, scientifically based. So, so I, or I could cite a few recent paper. But, um, so definitely a Langmuir circ circulation uh, is, is probably also, also wave related, wind wave related uh, processes. Uh, uh, with uh, stock drift would definitely probably be an important contributor, uh, I guess. Um, there might be also a smaller scale, uh, some mesoscale type processes. Um, some people argue about symmetric instability. Some people think that it might not be so so important. Um, yeah, internal wave turbulence at the base uh, in the in the thermocline in the in the picnic line. I, I'm not, I, I could I could basically list those processes and uh, yeah, I basically listed the probably the the set that are that have been discussed as important over the the past few years. But again, I think we we need more work to really uh, delineate which which one. Uh, based on observations in the sun machine. Hopefully in a, a couple of years time, you'll be able to give a better answer. Uh, yeah, so the next question is, do you consider carbon and heat as currently coupled in terms of uptake and storage? Uh, if yes, do you expect an uncoupling of these, uh, these as, uh, due to climate change? Um, yeah, they, they are they are coupled by uh, they are coupled through the in a way they are coupled through the circulation. Uh, yeah, in a way they are coupled through the circulation, but they are very different because. Um, they are very different because of, of the storage of carbon, of natural carbon in the ocean, I believe. Uh, which, uh, which, uh, so, so, which probably will, if there's a change of circulation uh, with, with more, uh, with more uh, deep water upwelling to the surface, uh, that might create an uncoupling uh, because basically it would outgas more of this natural carbon to the atmosphere. Um, maybe uh, putting the 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 sun ocean in, in a situation where uh, the sun ocean becomes a, a source of carbon for the atmosphere, uh, while the it it will still be a sink for the heat. So so y yes, there might be uncoupling in the future. Okay, uh, another question from the chat box. Um, is noting that the project is quite focused on the Weddell sector uh, and asking if there'll be any observational or modeling work targeting the Pacific sector and in particular particular the Belling Shells and, and Amundsen Seas. Uh, so so yes we uh, so the South Ocean is, is, is really big uh, and, and therefore, for the observation program, uh, for the observation of, of Sochik, we really uh, wanted to focus on one part of the sun machine. And we made the choice to focus on the, on the Weddell Sea. Uh, it's basically a pragmatic choice because of uh, a lot of our partners in Europe uh, have been focused uh, there um, uh, for a long term. So there's, there's a, a lot of uh, expertise there, a lot of logistic as well. And, uh, and long term uh, monitoring programs that have been going on there. There are other um, scientific reasons uh, with the Weddell Sea being a, a, an important uh, uh, um, uh, engine for producing uh, bottom water, uh, so important for, for the circulation. Um, there won't be any dedicated observations in other parts of the Southern Ocean, uh, but uh, there's in a few uh, in a few um, work packages we want to look at a larger scale like southern ocean scale circulation uh, or even global scale circulation in terms of modeling 
Uh, so we will include all the different regions of the world for the global scale view and, and all the South Nation for the South Nation views uh, for the modeling and for observation as well when we put together the Argo floats and the large scale circulation that will include all the different sector, uh, including Pacific sector. Uh, but again, no uh, dedicated work in the Pacific sector uh, and building ends and, and, and monsensis. Okay, so we have at the moment one more question to go. Um, so if you want to get any last questions in, now's your, now's your chance. But uh, the one that's going to finish off with at the moment is, uh, would it be possible to expand a little on the plans for the glider deployments uh, with regard to the sensors, the number of gliders and uh, the deployments as strategies, for example? Well, that's something that we are currently uh, discussing with the the partners um, to uh, to the, really the detail of the of the sampling strategy. Uh, but in term in terms of the the main aspects, uh, we'll have uh, we'll have three gliders or three gliders in the water uh, altogether for a full year. Um, uh, we are discussing we are basically discussing uh, a compromise between uh, between sampling frequency battery and and logistics uh, so cruises uh, we'll have uh, all the conventional uh, parameters on those gliders uh, including uh, including flowometer um, backscatter uh, and we uh, we Originally planned to have a micro rider, so a turbulence, uh, a turbulence sensor on one of the glider. Uh, it's not realistic to have it for one year because it's very uh, energy demanding. Uh, so we are investigating possibilities to deploy uh, a glider with uh, microstructure measurements uh, through a opportunistic uh, cruise. Basically, so we're basically we are, we are investigating different possibilities and best compromise between what we want to achieve and the logistic. Great. Um, so it seems we don't have any more questions. So I think uh, with that we'll wrap up. Um, so thank you for everybody for for joining this webinar. We had. Um, around about 200 people online at one, one point. So uh, it's a, a great success, I think. Uh, thank you for all your questions and for the, the discussion in the chat box. Um, and the just as a reminder, this, this webinar has been recorded, so we will be posting the recording online on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to uh, catch up on everything and uh, dive in a little bit more more closely um, and as uh, mentioned this is the first in a series of webinars as part of the so Sheet project so the subsequent ones will focus on some of the more details of uh, individual uh, work packages within the project um, so keep an eye out for eye out for those in the future but uh, most of all, thank you to uh, Jean Baptiste for his presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Joseph, for organizing. Great. Bye bye. Bye.